In order to get better acquainted with this likelihood function and to start understanding how we're going to analyze it, I wanted to work with what I called a micro example. So I wanted to work with a super teeny tiny model where we're only taking into account the number of greats that appear in a review and the number of disappointed that occur in a review. And I would like to make this a super micro example by just assuming that we have two different reviews. And because this is our training data, I'm gonna assume that we have a positive review and one negative review to hit both of those examples in the likelihood function. So X1, and as you can imagine, I've catered these examples to be relevant to the words that we're looking for. So X1, our positive review is great quality, great clarity, great purchase, you will not be disappointed. And even though there's that quantifier of not in front of the disappointed, that word still appears. So we would count three occurrences for V1 in X1, um, in this review X1, and for V2 in X1, we would have a one right there. For X2, we have two occurrences of the word disappointed and one occurrence of the word great. And so our V1 corresponding to X2 would be a one and our V2 corresponding to review X2 would be a two. So these are our examples here. And what that's gonna do for our likelihood function, we're gonna denote like A vector to be these coefficients A0, A1, and A2 in our scoring function. Our first review X1 was a positive review with three occurrences of the word great and one occurrence of the word disappointed. So when we go to that sigmoid function, we're just plugging in that value and that's going to be the probability that this is a good review. However, our review X2, it, we would like our scoring function to deem that a negative review. So when we plug into the sigmoid function, we should get a numerical value here that is less than 0.5, but that's good, right? We would like our probability of this being a good review to be low. And so the probability of our model accurately judging this review is given by the complement of that within one. So we use that one minus the probability here for that negative review. And this is our likelihood function. And you can see that even with this micro example, this is a kind of ugly function to take a look at. And if we were to have more reviews, this would just get longer and longer and longer in terms of products. Now, if you've ever done calculus before, you know that taking the derivative of sums of things is a whole lot easier than taking the derivative of products of things. And so the standard approach for this likelihood function is to use what's called logarithmic differentiation because logarithms take products and turn them into sums. And so computationally taking derivatives with what's called the log likelihood function will be a lot easier than taking derivatives of the likelihood function. So from now on, we'll be looking at what's called the log likelihood function as opposed to the likelihood function. Now I've gone ahead and put into Mathematica our likelihood function for this example, and in fact, our log likelihood function for this example, and had it compute the partial derivatives with respect to A0, A1, and A2, and I've shown those here for you. And it is actually not horrifically difficult by hand, pencil, and paper to compute what these partial derivatives would be if you've taken a multivariable calculus, but that's not quite the purpose of this video. Once we had these partial derivatives, remember that we're looking for maximum values of this log likelihood function or maximum values of the likelihood function in order to find the best coefficients for A0, A1, and A2. And so theoretically, we should find those maximums of the function by setting these derivatives equal to zero. Now, if you just want to look back for comparison's sake on what we did when we did linear regression and we were using that residual sum of squares as our function that we were trying to minimize in that case, we took derivatives of that function with respect to the slope and with respect to the y-intercept, and these were the equations that we got here. And there was a certain amount of algebra involved in setting those equal to zero and solving for the letters m and b in terms of the other things but it was very manageable and it was something that you could do by hand 
And even if you wanted to go up to a quadratic model, you could do that by hand. And it wouldn't necessarily be pleasant, but it was absolutely doable. I'm a lot more frightened thinking about taking the derivatives that I have here. They're much more complicated. They've got E's involved. I know there'd have to be logs all over the place. I've got three equations now instead of two equations. And the thought of all of that algebra makes me a little bit sad for setting these three equations equal to zero. It looks computationally much worse than it did for linear regression. But in fact, the story is a whole lot worse than that. If you do go into something like Mathematica and find these equations and try to set them equal to zero, there actually are not beautiful solutions for this. And it's something that needs to be tackled with numerical methods. You're not even going to be able to set these equal to zero and find a perfect, beautiful mathematical solution. So now is a time where we really need to abandon our purely mathematical approach and return to a different technique that we had for finding the maximum value because we're not just going to give up and go home. We really need that maximum value. And so here, since we're trying to maximize our likelihood or our log likelihood function, we're going to be using gradient ascent to come up with a maximum value that works for our purposes here. So that'll be the subject of our next Jupyter Notebook is implementing a gradient ascent algorithm. But for now, just keep in mind that that's where we're headed.